that way accepted. And by the way, none of those are your effect. Secondly, I said the scientific dispensation, the Ten Commandments and the Torah, however you approach that revolution of the human spirit, the dialogue with the higher power which took place in Sinai, however you analyze it, mankind would not be the same without it. The streams of its impact stretch across human consciousness, right down the ages, also accept it. Thirdly, I said, the phenomenon of prophecy, of foreseeing events thousands of years hence, of the panorama of human experience, of human destiny, and destructive sense, and its onward movement, interlocked with the specific human destiny, as it links with the universal destiny of peace and freedom. Also accepted. And finally, I submitted the destruction of the temple and the exile of the Jews close to 2,000 years ago. And here they hold to have said, why would you include that as a major event of your experience? I said, why? Because the destruction of the temple meant the loss of the spiritual anchor of the Jew. And his exile across the world meant the first time that a human experience, the concept of loneliness of an individual as a nation, the sense of a lack of spiritual wholesomeness, the desire to return to a cradle, to a land, to a source, to be reunited with a cradle inspiration that in itself symbolizes a whole gamut of human thoughts and feeling down the ages. It's found in musician and definition in the destruction of the temple and the withdrawal of the Jew from the land of his father. Moreover, with the Jewish exile, the entry of the Jew into the life lane the world civilization connects with all that flows from it. On this, they reserve that. But then they said to me, Now we objected. Truly, you represent Israel, but here we are scholars talking frankly and objectively about the record. Is the state of Israel an event in world history? I said, Frankly, as yet not. It is a phenomenon in world history that a nation, a people, snap asunder from a land for close to 2,000 years, and is back to the reality of never seeing the land, maintaining its vitality and unity rooted in prophetic faith, returning to this land with a phenomenal unity, uniting Jews from Western Europe and from the cave societies of North Africa and from the remote hinterland of India, all together in a decisive unity, a new strata of nationhood, which itself is ancient and always renewing, that in itself, and feeling at home in a land which has been desolated for close to 2,000 years, a land which has never accepted or adopted any other people, nor historically become identified with any entity, national or tribal. That is a phenomenon of history. It is not yet a great and decisive event of human history. This debate, as I said, took place a month before the war. If I were asked the same question, I probably will meet them again in New York in a few weeks' time. I would say today the prospects of Israel becoming an event of decisive significance in world history, that prospect has been drawn much closer by the Six Day War and even more by the endless ripples across the world scene which flow from it. For wherever you turn, the impact of this rapid victory, this fantastic transition from ultimate peril, or what seems to be that, to endless triumph, the endless calculations across the world's capitals, all of these are still issues which are unfolding the ultimate consequences and definitions of which still define the human eye and certainly the capacity for immediate analysis. But wherever you turn, you feel this impact within the Soviet bloc as it surveys its world penetration and the course of influence. Moscow is in constant meditation as its program in the Middle East, which cost it some three billion dollars over ten years, as it failed, but it's still in chance of success. 
Should it move to confrontation or should it continue to counsel caution? As its foreign aid program being well based, as its concept of Islam and the Arab world being founded in a reality, or is it purely a mirage of political illusion? Where is Moscow going, at least? And as it goes, what are its contacts with the Western world? Is there a ground for a contact, for a search, for a new world power approach to the Middle East? Or does the situation be now in other parts of the world blocking? All these questions surely lie pause in the thoughts of the analysts and political leaders in the Kremlin. As you move further away, Peking turns on Moscow violently and says you abandon the trend of communism in the Middle East. This has become a basic issue within the entire complex of communist power ranging from China right across Eastern Europe. With Eastern Europe, Romania has split apart from the Moscow line. In Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary, the problem is whether the commentary approach on Eastern and Middle East was correct. It is hotly debated. According to newspaper reports, leaders of the Polish army that called for Soviet experts to study whether the arms they have on the Warsaw Pact are sufficient validity in view of the collapse of Egyptian forces. All these matters, they stimulate and ferment across a vast block which is neighbor of the Middle East and whose courses and policies have prejudiced the possibility of peace over the past ten years. As you move further apart, as you go across the Uruguay from the United States, there are theses and thoughts and analyses and programs and concepts in the Middle East built up over 10 and even 20 and possibly 30 years. Millions of reams of papers written by counselors and advisors and foreign policy institutes, all the way to the air, as their concepts of personality and the balance of power and the future of the Middle East and the mainstreams of power in the Middle East have been shattered by a reality they could not perceive. If you go to London, which is edged and part today from the focal point of world power, whose influence in the Middle East has diminished to a very low point, again, British policy in the Middle East must necessarily be reappraised. In Paris, the prophecies of what would happen have vanished, with possible consequences for the validity of those who have played them. In Ottawa, in every other capital, where political analysts have followed this problem across the years, there's a vacuum of thought, and officials for many weeks and months hesitated to present their ministers with briefs and data and proposals, for in this vacuum they sought to regain their balance. The United Nations, which in 1956, against the background of the previous Suez conflict, moved onto the world scene as a major instrument for peacekeeping. That role was shattered by a miscalculation on May the 19th of this year, affecting the United Nations force of Sinai. And today, the United Nations must, as a collective body, realize that the lack, the frustration, the lack of action which it suffered and which is guilty over 20 years on the Arab Israel conflict. So, every capital you move, you feel the current of the of search. All over, there is a desire to probe new forces and new dialogues open across the world. Within the Arab world, before June the 5th, there were three camps. There was the moderate camp of Morocco and Tunis, maybe Jordan and Lebanon and Saudi Arabia, possibly in the background, which in their heart and hearts felt that war could not solve the problem and sought a political solution. But they had neither the capacity nor the expression nor the status, nor maybe the possibility of overcoming long-standing emotions to emerge into clear political thought. On the other side, there was Syria and Algeria, which pressed for immediate war, particularly Syria. In between stood President Nasser, who tilted to the side of Syria and Algeria in terms of the need of war as a solution of the problem. But counseling paradoxically enough to wait 
to wait until the Arab world is united, is powerful enough, and by the very dynamism of his presence, will be able to create a condition in which what he assumes to be an alien body of the Middle East would have itself fall apart. In the background of the Six Day War, there lay a phenomenal meeting of three circumstances. There was this same Syria which pressed for war and decided against the decision of the Arab summer conferences to force war on the Arab world by sending in El Qaqaq murder gangs into Israel, week in, week out, which we had to react. But that alone was not a war. There was the added consideration of the Soviet Union for the first time had found the government of Damascus, which in its ideological view was close to Moscow, very, very close. And the Soviet Union decided that come what may, they would not allow that regime to fall. So, in the year preceding the war, a remarkable dialogue took place between Israel and the Soviet Union. So he said to us, do not strike Syria. If you strike Syria, you're serving all, all interests, you're serving intelligence organizations, you are still the rest of the world, and that we cannot tolerate. And we said to them, we are neither soon nor cease to be soon. But we cannot live here if our farmers are killed day in day out in the world of living. We know part of Israel to survive either spiritually or in unity or in unity if our people are cut down no matter how remote the area near the frontier in the north. And he said, talk to Damascus and influence Damascus to halt this penetration and he naturally will not act. The answer of Moscow was they are doing their best and our best assessment is they tried to influence the Syrians. And the Syrians, like the nation of history, are beyond any influence, certainly the certainly, and possibly themselves. But there was a third factor in this meeting of circumstances. The third factor was the fact that in Cairo, that the president, when he came to power in 1952, he raised a great dream and vision across the Arab world of an Arab unity, with a further circle of Islamic unity, and ultimately African unity, circle within circle. And he set out on this process from 53, stage by stage. By 1958, he reached a turning point when he unified Egypt with Syria, and the United Arab Republic came to be. And that moment, he thought his dream was about to be realized. But within four years, the xenophobic, endemically unsafe Syrians revolted also against the Egyptian army. And in 1962, the Union of Egypt and Syria was snapped apart. Nasser never gave up the name of the United Arab Republic. He continued in this concept, which was an illusion, but kept on to it, because without it, he had lost the anchor of Taiyan. And as the dark months of the last year proceeded, as clash after clash developed in Syria, Nasser's traumatic impact of 62 stirred again within it. And as Syria said to him, if activity means anything, why do you sit silent in Cairo while we are challenged by Israel forces? Nasser again the old dream arose in his mind. And he decided he could not allow the Damascus regime to be overthrown, although this was never our purpose. Our purpose was to defend the lives of our citizens. The new assumption and assumption in Moscow in very April was that if Syria continued, the apparently would continue the provocation, and Israel naturally would strike back. A position might be created where the regime of Damascus would collapse. 
And so in the early days of May, these three factors met together to cause this vast explosion of the Six-Day War, the results of which are beginning, as I said, to unfold. Where do we stand today? What do we hope that we have? We feel that the balance in the Arab world, I spoke earlier of three camps before the year of the 50s, these three camps still exist. But I believe the balance of the modern element, of the more realistic element, is growing, although gradually. You had a situation where an element of realism is penetrating the Arab mind, where they're beginning to ask themselves whether further provocation, further attack, will not bring further disaster, whether this continuing chapter of resistance, of violence, of obstruction, of boycott, of blockade, has not the final analysis, had as yet one more chapter to Israel's stability and capacity to survive. This process may take a long time. It may be overturned, because nobody knows the impossibility involved. In order for this process to move ahead, the three things are essential. The first is that Israel's military deterrent capacity be maintained at the highest possible level. In other words, any dreams of any armed colonel or leader across the Middle East from Algeria to Damascus, a renewal of war in more favorable circumstances than June may offer it cause a reversal of Israel's present position. Such ideas must be rejected by the reality force of Israel's deterrent capacity. Secondly, it is crucial that the great powers keep their hands off the Middle East. They have done so till now. And though over ten years the involvement of the Cold War in the area prejudiced any chance of Arab Israel peace. But today, as Washington and Moscow and others stand apart from the degree, and in fact tell the parties to consider the situation with a Norwegian process. Although Russian policy is entirely different from American policy, but there is a slight common line at this stage in this respect. If this continues, the Arabs must come to a point where they will look straight and honest into the looking glass, see their failings and failure over 20 years, and begin to move in the direction of realism. I personally think the trend in the Middle East is towards peace. There may be trouble, there may be other change of reactions and counter-reactions, but I believe the basic stratum of the situation is a positive one, although its ultimate outcome may yet hang in balance. And thirdly, it is crucial that both the United Nations and the great capitals of the world the statesmen should cease playing ground with formulas, which are all extremely impressive in here and there and here. There can be no solution to Middle East until Arab and Jew face each other at the negotiating table, until this miasma complex of fear under 20 years of entrenchment and psychological frustration, until it is swept away by that direct communication which can only come from direct contact. No holding of literacy, no empty formulas, no banner recognition. All of this means nothing. But within a week or a month or a year or five years, as long as the veil of remoteness of hostility remains, these formulas can never reach that reality of communication, which is the only guarantee of peace. It is our slow process. It has not been easy for the Arabs to grasp the nature of Israel's residence, citizenship, and permanence in this country. I spoke earlier of the phenomenon of the people returning to the land after close to 2,000 years. This phenomenon is beyond the canon of 20th century thought. It touches roots of faith and continuity without parallel human analysis. The great thinkers of the world, the statesmen, grasp it to a degree, and it's not so easy, and has not been easy for our neighbors to fully comprehend it. But I believe that after three wars, the consciousness is slowly emerging in their minds that this cannot be some flotsam and jetsam of 
of an alien body, not rooted by anti persecution from Europe, brought here as a propaganda is brought them by Wall Street and Jewish machinations across the world. They must begin to realize there is essential truth here. There's something inherent, binding, decisive, permanent in this vast adventure of the spirit, which, as I said, has no parallel across the span of history. As this consciousness permeates, and it will permeate, provided external factors don't disrupt it, provided no illusion to furthermore rise their minds in face of this military power, provided United Nations and great capitals do not go along with them, in face of the formula of no value of total banality, and providing the hands up policy of the great powers and any direct involvement in the Middle East is sustained, then this bigger consciousness must grow to a plane. At that moment, the barrier will collapse, and as they collapse, a true dialogue develops, that may be indeed the state of Israel in existence of the core of the Middle East of a vast new area of progress and understanding and Islamic Jewish dialogue may be indeed as well proved to be one of the great and decisive events of history. For Islam has been doing it many times across the gamut of history and can meet again with no basic hostility there in a spiritual sense. It is a political conflict and not a spiritual one. It is a misunderstanding of the nature of Israel and the nature of his land. These have the issues at stake, and they may move on. I have spoken to you, ladies and gentlemen, an outline of the dialogue as they unfold across the world in this phenomenal transition providential in its essence of Israel from mortal peril to the actual achievement of the dialogue with the states of the Western world, who 20 years have conquered the Middle East without any decisive to cut at the roots of direct communication and establish that as the basic and only thesis of the Middle East. They have come forward out of the straight to cannot keep the Middle East beyond the context of world affairs, that there be charter of United Nations on negotiations of peace against boycott and blockade and worldwide atmosphere and violence and threat all over the world. But there be some remote island called the Middle East, which is not so remote that it disrupts the world of faith. That your statesmen can preach peace in every form, but when it comes to the Middle East, they can turn aside and say it is not better. This is a new dialogue in the Western capitals. And in within this dialogue, concepts of power here have vanished or be heavily defeated. The natural threat of our world over the years has proved to be battle and futile. We now know over the past months the world has been proved clearly that the Arabs need to rest to buy the oil, more than the rest needs the Arabs to sell the oil. And I will hold you with the Suez Canal. But that too has proved to be much more secondary importance than ever assumed. And so with these major, I would say, prejudices, arising from misunderstanding as they are dissipated to some degree, but not entirely, this dialogue with the Western world can unfold. And I spoke of the dialogue with this intuitive and visible contact with the Arab world, beyond the artillery duels and the air flights, beyond those the outcome of terror and hostility, of this flicker of light which I sincerely believe is developing at a certain point, provided it is not French the forest times and fulfillment. But there's a third dialogue, and that too is probably the most exotic, a dialogue of Roman Jerusalem, which has developed after the Six Day War. The Jews back in Jerusalem, under Israel's sovereignty, for the first time in close to 2,000 years. In this respect, the wing of history is turned. I was in Rome some months ago, and after we negotiated with the patriarchs in the old city and the state of Jerusalem, and one day one of the leading critics, he took a document and he said to me, I am the 96th patriarch of Jerusalem. My first predecessor was appointed in the holy city by the council of Chalcedon in 451. 
And therefore, if you want to negotiate on the holy places in Jerusalem, I am the person you must first talk to. As we develop this fall in pieces and stay the down the ages, I must admit that diplomatically I have some of it is. Because my mind traveled from the contemporary scene, from his palace and all his majesty and his priestly acolytes around him. And as he talked and talked of his record down the ages, my mind too flashed back to 1400, 451. So 1550 years ago. At that time, it was 200 years. I reminded myself about the closing of the Mishnah in the face of the old law. It was 50 years after the redaction of what we call the Jerusalem Talmud, which was compiled in the land of Israel. It was just at the time when the entire sector of spiritual authority of the Jewish people had moved to Babylon, and the Babylonian Talmud was still reaching its consummation. At that time, Jerusalem was on the account of the land of for 300 years, no Jew could physically treasure the sacred soul of the sacred city with which is eternity, past, present, and future, in endless continuity is linked. At that time, the remnants of the community of Palestine were on the verge of extinction. Within 90 years, they were derived in an ultimate revolt against Persia and to be dispersed across the world. And within two centuries, Islam under Omar was to conquer Jerusalem. But in 451, the Council of Chalcedon appointed the first Christian patriarch of Jerusalem. And with that, to any observer of those days, to lose the power of Rome, temporal, and spiritual, a hundred years after Constantine, the Christian emperor, in power, at that time, in face of such vast power, the Persia weak and Egypt to the throne, with Greece, Greek philosophy, having given its final word, this seems to be the ultimate in human experience and wisdom and spiritual impulse. And at that moment, Jerusalem, not only physically, but spiritually, seemed to be snatched from Jewish hands for all time. And as the patriarch continued to speak, I thought to go to you in a synagogue in 451, in Rome and in Crete, in Cyprus, in Alexandria, and in the first community of Jewry, and said on that day, a patriarch has been appointed in Jerusalem about 1550 years hence. Prophecy will be fulfilled. A Jewish official will come to the old city of Jerusalem, and the 96th descendant of this first patriarch will say to them, Jerusalem, I agree with you, but assure me and assure my church and Christendom the rights we know you have promised to assure them. And the assurance was given without difficulty, but with us as a central aspect of our foreign policy, to reach agreement on the religious status and the universal interest in the Holy City of Jerusalem. And as I thought of this remarkable, phenomenal swing of history, as if the wheel of history had turned round, and my mind moved back to the bottom of the great events of history, and I thought we are on the verge of the phenomenon turning into the great event. But in order to bring it about totally, we come to the final dialogue. And the final dialogue is within the soul of the Jewish people. For so before the six days of war, great questions were raised of new ideologies of Israel and diaspora, and Israel declining in influence, and Jerusalem having lost its impact to some degree on the Jewish soul across the world. And then came those terrible weeks of isolation, and Israel stood in more peril. And every Jew across the world, even those remote, as remote one can be, from their faith and their people and his association, they suddenly felt an isolation which touched them to their depths. And they suddenly understood the ancient and grasped why the word Abraham may be, what is Abraham the Hebrew mean, that Israel is on one side of the world and all the rest of the world on the other. At that moment, a new unity was formed. And we refuse to believe that as this new epoch unfolds, that unity will not find ever deeply expression. 
kind of you are coming here not only on the philanthropic basis, but on the scales for that basis, on the strength of spiritual identification, it will find that we will believe it, and this is crucial to our existence and future, as the whole week of the of thousands of you to study here. It's the vast panorama of a new dialogue, not in speech that has gone along in today and was frustrated for all the years, and only in form of self-speech, which is self-displayed, but in a continuing and unfolding action, as you are not partners, because partners means two sides of an enterprise, but one and the same with us as the great event of the Jewish state in its dispensation unfold in the future. <laughs> I shall do my best in brief to try to come up for you before you leave. Our inner thoughts, Israel's processes and progress, and how she marches to what measure of rational analysis in the great unknown of the future. I'm sure that you here, as you spent the last week, have been touched by this new spirit that the denounced of God on the world, which stands among all you from across the world as we reach the falls of this world of the The leader is in one sense, yet expansive in the other, the part of the temporary, yet so prominent, seemingly a must Believing deeper than the other people. Now, how should I describe to you, in brief, the vast panorama of Israel's inner thought, the relations with the Middle East, the relations on a global scale, the great spiritual confrontations she has to meet, and how she plans this in the future? I would say, firstly, <laughs> This problem, as you, this group, and more, ever understand and other groups in this country, is not only a problem of the balance of world power in the region, but only a problem of the future in the area of such, but only a meeting of the Arab capital, the Arab world, and the world. It extends far beyond the vast framework which covers Beijing, Moscow, Moscow, Belgrade, Moscow, Warsaw, Moscow, Washington, and the basic balance of forces of the world. The British Empire gives its last death gas, the attempt of France to regain position across North Africa, right across the Arab world. The whole future of mutualist bloc has been heavily damaged by the invasion of Czechoslovakia. The whole balance 
I would say a geopolitical forces, at some point or another, cannot escape the unfolding epoch in the Middle East. But again, even deeper, this issue has cosmic proportions. Any of them from the Jew is totally unnecessary, because the Jew who doesn't deal with it is lacking in basic identification. Surely to an audience of this nature, one doesn't need to dwell on this point. But even in world spiritual day, we have this confrontation of Rome and Jerusalem after close to 2,000 years. We have a confrontation with Islam. In both cases, the city in which we now are sitting, the city of Shina, the city of eternal prophecy, the city of lasting inspiration for the Jewish people, is the focal point of conflict and presence, maybe of unfolding dialogue in the future. My duties carry me across the world very often, and I face the dichotomy moving from the chancelleries of the great, from the far offices where decisions are taken which can affect this country and the area, from meetings in Rome with the princes of the church, from meetings with Arabs in this part of the world, and when all this comes back to our own people, I would say even with a sense of dichotomy, whereas one faces the outer world as one engages in rim after rim of dialogue, you feel a loss of suspense, a great questioning as to what is the nature of this spiritual adventure which is Israel reform? What lies behind this sudden leap forward history from the gas ovens of Auschwitz only 25 years ago to becoming a, if not the major force in the Middle East today, a force which stretches from the vast artery world commerce and power, the Suez Canal, right across the land of Israel, up to the Golan Heights. At each point, meeting vast forces in the east and west, and within the Arab world, as it too seeks its course into the unknown. How can I describe to you this cosmic nature of the problem? I had a discussion in the great publishing house only some months ago, with a publisher who was bringing out a book for non Jews, page 15 to 18, on major perspectives of world history. He was a professor who was writing it in this publishing house, a book guaranteed to be sold across the university, the final classes of secondary school, what you call college in the United States. The idea being to give some essence, some common perspective some broad viewpoint of the unfolding of human experience down the ages, so that from that point, the students could go into a deeper study in history, period by period. Now, this man, an old Jew, professor at Leeds University, he consulted me, and he said he's got trouble with the Jewish friend. He must put in the Jews somewhere in this volume. And they gave him various ideas in which he consulted me, and I counseled him to best my ideas. And he agreed the Jewish contribution to civilization was significant indeed. Yes. The Jews deserved the mention. And he went over period after period. What were the turning points of the Jewish experience? But he said, my problem is that the Jewish, my Jewish friends say you must introduce the destruction of the Jewish temple into a panorama of world history. And I, as a rational historian, can't agree with him. Because in those days, La Habil, this Hayat. There are hundreds of thousands of sacred shrines of the ancient world were destroyed. The Mongolians are penetrating China for a new millennium of Chinese history. India, as we know it today, was a vast amalgam, a vast turning point of tribes seeking some identity. Across the world, we call the Western and Eastern world of today, the Roman Empire, the Supreme. The Legion battling the wars of empire of what is England today across the North Africa, right down to the Persian Gulf. And it is true, so he said, that it took more than two legions to quench the forces of Judea, the last revolt of our book 
even the early instruction of the devil. There's also true that in reporting, the commander of the legions did not salute the normal setting. The usual language had always well with that. But he said, in basic analysis, anybody who studied the rise and fall of the Roman Empire cannot accept any chauvinistic concept Jews might have that the battle of the Jews against Rome really tore apart or began the process of the ripping apart of the Roman Empire as the greatest power the world has known. After all, you, the Jews, were just brought more tribe in this vast amalgam of subject people which Rome managed to control the break. Wherefore, then, has the destruction of the Jewish temple got any significance on a major scale in the conscience of mankind? I told them that extraneously, he's absolutely right, that indeed the rational historian could make such an argument. Well, I told them of my talks in Rome with the Vatican, of this very exotic dialogue and holding we go to Jerusalem after close to 2,000 years. I told them what the Cardinals told me, the princes of the church, and we can only talk to you on a diplomatic level. We can talk to you as a diplomatic representative of one more state which holds Jerusalem at present. And we, with our worldwide half-blood interests, must assure our state and our access to our institutions. But we cannot discuss this issue with you theologically. The nature of the Jewish restoration to Jerusalem, this is not the subject of our thought. I asked them, why is this? And they said to do so would mean a very deep trust indeed into the fabric of Christian thought over centuries. And this at present we are not prepared to do. And again, if you move further to speak to Ireland, you hear the echo of Islam ranging from the Atlantic Ocean to the Persian Gulf and down to Southeast Asia, to Pakistan, to Indonesia, or again you face probably the major part of the southern half of the globe and close to a billion people. And again the issue comes back to Jerusalem. They tell you there can be no yielding of this city, for without it, Arab and Islamic humiliation is far too deep for us to survive with spiritual self-respect. And so this issue of the Jew in Jerusalem, the Jew in sovereignty in Jerusalem, the Jew restored after an exile, this phenomenal unity of man and people symbolized in its ultimate essence of the Jewish presence in this city, in the city of cities in human history. This affects major centers of world thought today whether the Catholic be agnostic or the Muslim or most of his religion, he does ultimately anchor back on this issue to the basic question, what is the meaning of the Jew and Jew? Is this but a temporary phase, 17, 18 conquests in history, just one more? Or has it got a deeper meaning? And if it has a deeper meaning, where do Christianity and Islam in their broad perspective of human experience, where do they stand in relation to it? And I told this professor of history that any modern man cannot understand in my mind the unfolding of basic spiritual processes which have at a certain point their relationship to the Jew and Jerusalem today, with all the means for the balance of world forces and even deeper for the spiritual dialogue of unfolding without understanding the destruction of the Jewish temple two thousand years ago. Or without the concept of exile which sprang from that destruction and which became a terminology accepted across the entire dictionary of human form. The concept of Shinta Vigaluta, of your whole the divine presence itself is an exile with its people. Without that concept, there could be no return. There could be no supremacy of the spiritual over the material factor of human history, which the Israel record symbolizes. And Jerusalem would have been just one event in the story of the nation which has become petrified across the passage of history. And so the two link, and they link in one essence. 
the essence being the issue of continuity. The professor accepted the thesis that the destruction of the Second Temple against the canvas of the War of 1967 what made the bell around this city could not be ignored in any summary of world events across the ages. What I was trying to say to him was that the basic problem, the basic issue within the Jewish soul and in the dialogue with the various frameworks with whom we speak is ultimately this issue of continuity. Here lies everything compressed, digested, summarized, and uplifted. What are these ribs of dialogue? There is a dialogue with the Western world, with our friends in the United States and Canada, United Kingdom, across Latin America, Benelux, Scandinavia, they have more or less accepted that there can be no return to the situation of 1967. There's no point in pressing Israel to withdraw to a further abyss of uncertainty and insecurity such as hung over day in day out for close to 20 years. However, let us be frank, we have differences of opinion. The differences relate, and I'm not talking anything final, for all this is in the gestated period, has not come to the test that one can feel what one's fingertips.
is what will constitute secure boundaries to which we are requested to withdraw. There are differences as to what is the validity of international guarantees. There are differences of assessments over the past year and a half as to the flow of events. The ultimate difference is in the immediate sense in whose favor is time working. For across the Western world, they have their doubts as to whether time is working in favor of Israel and indeed of the Western world. I recall last year in January 68, the Prime Minister visited the President of the United States, Texas. We have here the ex minister from Washington with us, and our ambassador to Canada, Ambassador Everall, who is present with us. The central core of the debate was in whose favor is time working? The President put his case as we went across to Canada to speak to Prime Minister Pearson. He had his background from his Canadian ambassador in Washington. And he too opened the talk by saying, Mr. Prime Minister, surely time is not in your favor. And from there we flew to London. We were received by Mr. George Brown, the former Prime Minister and Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. In a vast room with all the portraits of Britain's heyday of greatness, the great foreign secretary, we sat down at the table facing the foreign secretary. And then he suddenly, for peculiar reason, surrounded by his permanent vision, he suddenly had a slip in the diplomatic sense, and aside, a soliloquy. And as he opened with a regular question, Mr. Prime Minister, we are worried in whose favor is time working? He suddenly halted, and he spoke to himself, and he said, what did I say? I said, Israel is a time. But after all, Israel is timeless. But he shook himself back into sobriety very rapidly. And he immediately said, let me put our case why time is not working in your favor. I would say that the central debate of the Western world Although it can be very severe, and may become severer still, and let us acknowledge facts, we may in the coming months or the coming years, we may have to stand isolated against a hostile world, not only of our enemy, but even of our friend. This may involve a vast, maybe the greatest test of Jewish endurance, of Jewish faith versus Arab faithlessness but also Jewish capacity to prove the ancient Midrash, Abraham Ha'ibri, Abraham Ha'ibri, he said, the whole whole land here, he said. But apart from the political phraseology and assessment into the future, there is this crucial question of the present. In whose time, in whose favor has time worked till today? I would submit a thesis which can be argued back and forth that so far it has worked in our favor. The assessments we heard, and I take January 68 as a point of issue, were of the possibilities of Soviet intervention in the Middle East, of Arab societies collapsing to communism, King Hussein of Jordan being swept away by Arab terrorists and Egyptian agents, of the Fatah turning Israel into a second Algeria, of Bayesian economic collapse in Israel, of Nasser's armies as they develop, forcing the issue on the canal and elsewhere. So far, none of these assessments have been vindicated by them. This is not to say that they are completely out of shot in terms of realism. And so far, Baruch Hashem, none of them have taken place. On the other hand, in the course of this year and a half, the world has learned to acknowledge Israel's capacity for standing. It is no mere chance to the Soviet Union which till May 68 threatened Israel the in the out. From that time began to cooperate with Yahweh and at least to seek some cooperation in its external posture. But who can know its inner mind? It is no mere chance that the Soviet Union has attempted to fall in line with some international consensus, which though extremely hostile to us, at least is remote in very considerable degree from the animosity and threats which characterize their policies until May of last year. Why is this? It is because the Soviet Union realized that Israel will fight at 
without peace we will not yield. And Moscow is pressed by Nasser who says, How long can I be in this dilemma? How long can I face my officer call? And the whole of Sinai in their hands and the canal is sealed up. How long can I withstand their pressures for what may indeed be suicidal action? But I am faced with a dilemma of suicide, either in action or in inaction. And Moscow's reply is we will try to force Israel diplomatically to yield. In the meantime, under no account, there you who get involved in a venture, the outcome of which nobody can know. I would say this is the first of our capacity to stand of time as it is worth. Secondly, if we take the issue of Jerusalem, the fact is that today the concept of redividing this city is obsolete in the minds of the world, even I would believe in that of the Soviet Union. And again, across this hotel, the barbed wire goes up, and the city is half, cut in half, a second Berlin, and that has receded from international consciousness. This does not mean the world has accepted our claim, our position, our sovereignty in unified Jerusalem. But it does mean a certain movement from what was accepted for over 20 years to what the situation is today. And movements in history, particularly when the city of eternity is involved, we cannot expect them to be too rapid. But thirdly, on the issue of time, here we come to the crucial dialogue deeper than all others, and that is the intuitive meeting, now expressed for 20 years, totally intuitive, of Jew and Arab. What have this year and a half done in this field? Have they created any hope of this miasma of hatred at some time disappearing? Has this iron curtain really been raised, or are we just living in a mirage in the desert? Are we realists in talking of peace? Or is this purely a political formula for argumentation alone without any realistic hope of implementation? This is very difficult to judge because the Arab mind, with all its oriental imagery and expression, remains ultimately a closed mind. And here lies the paradox, for even deeper, one does not know with the Arabs themselves know their policy and their place in the world seed in our time. But we face a vast world of 40 million Arabs in this part of the East alone. And the question arises over the past year and a half, is there any movement? Or is everything as it was? And do we face this specter two, three, five, ten years hence, this vast world, as it coheses its unity, as it develops its dynamism, its ethos, its culture, its armies, its purpose, pressing down upon what they consider, or have considered for the past 20 and 40 years, to be an alien body striking in the very essence of the heart of the Arab homeland. And what I say now is my assessment. Many of my colleagues will accept it. I believe that although the danger of war has not proceeded, Although the Arab armies are preparing for further war, I believe that as they come closer to war, they also simultaneously come deeper to this agonizing reappraisal as to whether indeed war will solve their problems, whether indeed their course over 20 years has been prudent, or whether they are marching to another catastrophe. I would say for the first time in the Arab mind, the possibilities are tilted on some balance. For before June 67, everything was so simple. As Nasser himself, only two months before the war, told a foreign observer, I do not need to fight them to destroy them. Time will vitiate them, will destroy their sinews, will snap their unity. This people cannot remain alone with an oasis in a vast world hostile world surrounding them. As we get stronger, the very force of our dynamism without action will push them out of the area. How long, Nasser asked, can world Jewry feel as one people 
to this tiny grouping in the Middle East. Surely it is against every logic this must snap. And he spoke of the Arab minority with its vast birth rates. And he spoke of the internal stresses of Ashkenazim and Sephardim. And he spoke of the economic future of world Jewry sustaining what he calls artificial states. And he said, every logic indicates it will perish of itself. And the words he used were, those Jews who will remain there will be like the Maronites in Lebanon or the Copts in Egypt. Does he really think so today? With all his blustering and his threats, true, he's dedicated to Arab fatalism, for after all, his patriotism grew from that and depends upon that. But we have the feeling that the Arab world, where some of its leaders realize that somewhere they misconstrued the spiritual adventure which is Israel over 20 years. They do not believe today with that firmness, and I speak here not from speculation alone, with that firmness which characterized their dogma, their axiom for 20 years, that here is about the flotsam and jetsam of refugee problem, the chance survivors of Nazi death camps, linked together with oppressed Jews from the Eastern communities across the Middle East. They're beginning to grasp that there's something deeper here it becomes for them truly the world of the unknown from which they shrink in fear. But their dogma, their axiom, their analysis, something has gone wrong. And they too, for the first time, march side by side with us into the unknown. No longer is the dilemma one-sided. No longer do we sit and ask, how do we survive 10, 20, 30 years hence? For the first time in the highest Arab council that they sit with each other, for the first time they talk some element of truth, discarding from it that oriental imagery with which they enshroud their worlds presented to the Arab masses. And they talk for the first time of Arab survival. And they say, if we cannot get back to the Western Bank, what happens to the Kingdom of Jordan? If we cannot open the canal and retrieve the peninsula, Sinai Peninsula, what becomes of Egypt? What will become of our regimes? Where do we move? And so the dilemma is at least mutual and common at this day. Here lies the crucial point. And as they are in the same dilemma as we, they talk to us. They talk to us in many places. And they talk across the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, day in, day out. And at some point, the monster image of Israel has changed, not in terms of their political acceptance, but at least in terms of human psychology. And so there is a movement, a movement of thought. This may not produce any immediate result. Many years, maybe decades, may pass before a formal peace is signed, although there is a possibility to come earlier. But for the first time in their minds, Israel is part of the Middle East, and their dilemma is acute as ours, and they search in the Middle East and throughout the world how to overcome the dilemma. Here maybe lies the key, but precisely because of that, the pressures will grow. Those Arabs who claim that only war to the courts, their voice gets stronger as the Arab armies reach higher military level. Their pressure on the world powers increases. Their blackmail, the sense of panic they introduce of war breaking out every day, this constant firing on the frontiers to keep it alive as a world issue of momentous proportions, the joint vast parade of propaganda of Moscow, of Paris, and the Arab capitals, all moves to a pitch, and the pitch being to force us to yield before the crisis overtakes the Arab mind. This is essentially the race of time in the Middle East. And as I said, it is essentially a vast test of Jewish faith and Arab fatalism. Can we face up to it? This is the basic issue. We can yield today for temporary advantage. I am sure that any agreement reached may keep us five, ten, even twenty years tranquil. 
But a moment will come in history when we'll be asked, why did you yield? Was it because you didn't have enough money? Was it because you got the phantom planes and couldn't pay for them? Was it because you couldn't maintain your reserve army of 10, 20, 30,000 soldiers, more day in, day out, all the time increasing, keeping the frontiers? Was it because you couldn't take the nervous tension of always being under pressure day in, day out, not knowing what the moral brings? Or was it because the Jewish people throughout the world, they fought at standing with you if necessary in isolation? All these questions will be asked by the historian if God forbid we yield. But we have no intention of yielding. How but may, no matter the sacrifice, no matter the financial cost, we will not cast away Jewish history just like that. We will stand where we are and insist upon peace. And let us see the other flow of thought and test as it moves across the capital of the Middle East and throughout the world. But for this you need iron nerves, you need endless faith, you need Jewish unity of the highest order, you need the Jew to feel that this is a new epoch of Jewish history. If we are sure that this is not temporary phase, but we've entered a broad uplands of a new world for the Jewish people, this sense of continuity flowing from this city this sense will impart itself across the Middle East and across the world. But if we yield the thought of diplomatic formulations because of a sense of weakness, because of the unknown, we may cast away an opportunity which will never return. This is the issue we face. And let us not minimize the difficulties. It's not so simple to face Soviet threats. It's not so simple to be sniped at across the canal the in the out. It's not so simple to be in a city with tens of thousands of Arabs with the danger of explosion at every moment. It's not so easy for the settlements to sit in the Bay of Sand Valley and rush to the shelters night after night. All oh, this might be easy if you could answer them when will be the end of it. But we must have faith and believe the end will bring with us triumph and victory. But if in Israel you grasp this sense of the unknown, you grasp this capacity to march in faith and unity, across the United States, tell them these are not campaigns like every year. Again, an emergency campaign, one, two, three. It's not a case of giving money. It's a case of total identification. And this alone, in total unity, will give us the strength to move from Yitzhak Hashem to the realization of this great and unprecedented epoch in which we live.
although they told me that in small places it's a very few Jews, but the intermediates between, of course, the only the black either with the British or with the Americans, but this is not exist. But all the Jews consider themselves as Jews. That's why I was also in Southern America, the first time in my life. In Brazil, in Argentine, and in Uruguay. <coughs> in Brazil, there are black, but the black is so much of the black. There are Indians. I know the American also is from India, but I've never seen, I've lived three years in America, I've never seen an Indian. <laughs> but they are the new Americans, but I know the fact. But in Argentine, there's not a one black man, and there's no Indian, no white man. Because those, the, the, the Spanish people who came first to South Africa, they killed all the people there. They didn't eat a single Indian, a single non white man. But the American has done not in fact 100%. And they didn't do the all that. The majority they killed. So in the head of the party, they brought black people from that big one. Black people from that. They brought them. 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 But then, I've seen the children, not only the girls who are not children. As you know, there was a Baron Hills in the end of the 19th century. Where the idea Jews must have their own state. But this came to Palestine, because then Palestine was a part of Turkey. To me, they always were in Turkey. He was afraid if he would buy land there, then they would take the land. He decided to do it in, in Argentina. And really, he bought land in Argentina much more than the whole Palestine. And many Jews.